Welcome to the Cloudonaut podcast. We are your hosts, Andreas and Michael Wittig. We have been building on AWS since 2009. In this podcast, you can follow along as we develop products like BucketV, Marbot, and HyperEnv and learn from our practice. This is episode number 82, which we are recording on October the 11th in 2023. In case you're watching this live on YouTube or LinkedIn, feel free to ask your questions and we will make sure to answer them and during the show. So Andreas, let's jump into what we learned in the last two weeks. So what's on your list? Yeah, Michael. So um, I've written about a thing that I learned um, when it comes to monitoring a Lambda function. So Lambda functions, like many other AWS services, they write CloudWatch metrics. Um, and then we typically use CloudWatch alarms to monitor those metrics. So for Lambda, for example, uh, we want to get notified if uh, Lambda functions fail, so there's an error metric, um, and you want to monitor uh, those uh, thing, kind of things. And um, we have uh, a lot of Lambda functions, so some of our applications are serverless. For example, the backend for Marbot, our monitoring solution is serverless. So there are many Lambda functions and many CloudWatch alarms monitoring those Lambda functions. But then a customer was reporting an issue and told us that a small part of our functionality was not working. So I started debugging uh, and I found out that um, one of our Lambda functions was sometimes uh, failing. So the invocation failed uh, sometimes. Um, but I wondered because we did not receive any alerts. So the CloudWatch alarm was uh, in status OK all the time. So we didn't get notified about this issue. Uh, and so I digged a little bit deeper and I found out about something that I've never heard before when reading through the documentation. And this is a Lambda function uh, reports the metrics of an invocation with the start timestamp of the Lambda function invocation. Um, but then a Lambda function can run up to 15 minutes. So if it, uh, for example, fails uh, after 14 minutes, it will still report the failure with the timestamp from the invocation start. And the problem that we had was that the, some of our CloudWatch alarms we're only looking back five minutes. So the alarm was defined in a way, um, look back uh, one ev ev evaluation period of five minutes. And so the problem was when the Lambda function failed, for example, anything basically above five minutes uh, invocation time, then our CloudWatch alert um, was not triggering. And so this is what happened. So um, that means you, if you are using CloudWatch alarms to monitor Lambda functions, you should go and check the configuration and make sure that the CloudWatch evaluation period is uh, larger than the Lambda function timeout that you configure. And you have to ensure that this is uh, the case because otherwise it's possible that you are missing uh, some of the information in the metrics. So this is something that I learned. Um, so <laughs> I don't know, we have been monitoring those Lambda functions <laughs> for years that way, but now um, I found that out and fixed all our CloudWatch alarms. Yeah, Andreas, that's a good, a good learning. So I wasn't aware of that as well. Um, so we should definitely make sure to keep that in our mind when defining CloudWatch alarms yeah. for Lambda functions in the future, yeah. right? <laughs> I've, I've also written a blog post about that. I will put the links in yeah. the show notes. So if you want to reread the details and uh, check that out. So if in two years I search for the problem, I will find <laughs> the blog post probably. <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> All right. So. Uh, Andreas, I worked a little bit on um, um, our uh, Bucket AV product. So this is our antivirus for Amazon S3 product. And just a little bit of context to understand what I'm talking about now is that the way our customers install the product in their AWS accounts is uh, via a CloudFormation template. So basically, our AWS Marketplace um, has a capability to uh, purchase products that are then delivered using CloudFormation. All right, and so far we have maintained six YAML files for our product. So we have two engines and for each engine we offer three networking options. So it's six uh, templates. 
So when we change something in the template, we usually have to copy it to five other templates. And I think as anyone can agree, that's not a, an ideal solution. So we are aware of that. And as always, I mean, we have feature requests and we have like things to improve in our code base. So we prioritize feature requests uh, over, over uh, those internal uh, optimizations. But then uh, we finally decided that we should tackle that problem. So I was looking for ways to generate a CloudFormation template in a, um, in a way that we can reuse parts of the templates because um, there are parts that are different. So I told you that we have different networking options. So we have a public VPC, a private VPC, and also the option that the customer brings its own VPC. So those are different, but for example, the auto scaling groups, the SQS queues, uh, the CloudWatch alarms, and so they are in, 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 in many cases the same. So it was important for us to reuse parts of the templates. So there are a couple of solutions, uh, but I finally decide to use the AWS CDK. Um, but not in the way that most people use it um, for. So what I wanted to do is this, I've, I just want to generate the YAML templates, nothing more, nothing less. And I also don't like magic. So I, I, I just want to have this functionality. Okay, turn this into a template, nothing more. Um, while doing this, I uh, was running into one challenge. Uh, so how can I ensure that what I create with the CDK is ex an exact match of what uh, of the old template. And to kind of ensure that I um, wrote a little script and I will share the code to that in, in, the, in, the, in the chat um, to basically compare two CloudFormation templates and diffing them and it displays quite nicely the, the, the differences. So with this approach, I was kind of able to validate that what I do in CDK is actually an exact copy of the old template. And this was very helpful and I catch a lot of issues that I was running into. So it was really, this proved a very uh, important step in the migration. Um, okay, what else is uh, important? Um, there is no magic way to convert an existing YAML template into CDK code. So if you search for that problem, you will see that there was a kind of, uh, it was not like officially supported thing, but it was kind of an, 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 uh, an, I would say like a proof of concept from AWS, but it doesn't work with the current version of the CDK. And, but besides that, there's nothing to do that for you. So it's basically manual copy and paste work with a lot of manual editing. Um, so um, it helps to kind of utilize some functionality of your editor to do that. So for example, um, when I copy the properties from the CloudFormation template into the CDK code, I basically have to convert Pascal case names of the properties into what CDK um, does, in the, and this is camel case. So basically I have to change the, the first character from uppercase to lowercase in all the properties. And so this is one of the things where your editor can, can help you if, if it is able to do that. So I was using Sublime and, and Sublime can do it for me. So that was really helpful. Um, as I already mentioned, I'm not interested in magic and also not in CDK magic. So um, the reason why I don't like this is that I want to understand what's going on. And there are two options to do that. Uh, either you can understand the magic and then it's no, not magic anymore, but I'm not interested in, in kind of deep diving into the CDK. So I was just using stuff that is um, very straightforward. And in CDK, uh, there are uh, constructs. And there are different layers of abstractions. And the first layer, the layer one, is basically a one-to-one -one, uh, representation of the CloudFormation resource itself. So it has exactly the same properties and it does nothing else than describing this single resource. If you use a L2 and L3 construct, it's possible that they actually do more than just one resource if you create the construct. So it could be that they also add IAM permissions and stuff like this. Um, so for me, I was not interested in that. I, I just use L1 constructs, sorry, L1 constructs. And the cool thing is that the properties are really the same and the semantics are the same than in the CloudFormation resource. The only difference that I mentioned is that, I mean, Pascal case becomes camel case. And also you probably have to change typings a little bit from YAML to, um, to the programming language that you use. In my case, I, I use JavaScript, um, but um, that's um, kind of straightforward to do. Um, I don't use any of the functionality of or like this, uh, or say uh, the, 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 
the additional functionality that the CDK provides. So for example, I don't use custom constructs or stuff. I just use JavaScript code, JavaScript functions. And that's, that's good enough for me. I understand what's going on and, and there is no, no hidden stuff going on. Um, we might change that in the future, uh, but for this first step where we really want to have a one-on-one -on -one migration, uh, basically we want to avoid that our customers when they update to the next version have to replace lots of resources. So we have everything kept the same um, for this reason. So another benefit that we have from using the CDK now instead of um, the old approach is that we can build our JavaScript code that we use for Lambda functions inside the CDK. And all our Lambda functions are so-called inline functions. So this means the code is in the CloudFormation template. And the reason for that is that AWS Marketplace does not allow us to reach or basically fetch code from, from somewhere else than their systems and their systems only support AMIs at the moment. Um, so what we do is we use a small helper function and I can share the link to that as well. Um, let me quickly copy that. And with that helper function, I basically trigger an ES build and this returns the string of the code that I can then use as the inline code for my function. And that's very neat because I can do all kinds of uh, things there and I still end up with one JavaScript string that represents my code. So I can have many files in my uh, code. I can reuse stuff. I can have tests and all this thing, but still in the CloudFormation template at the end, it's just a string. So that's very cool. Um, we are very happy with the result and we are actually at the moment that like this day and, and yesterday, I was doing more or less the same migration work for other parts of our code base. So we are moving more and more templates into the CDK approach that I described um, because we really benefit from the code sharing. Um, so ensure that uh, all the templates use the same kind of um, properties and stuff. Um, and one kind of side note, so while I did the migration and while I did all the divving, I, I discovered a couple of things that were actually inconsistent between our templates. So now they are kind of in a, in a better shape than before, uh, which is cool. So I'm very happy with that, Andreas. Yeah, that sounds cool, Michael. So I think the, the thing here really is the, the CloudFormation templates um, are really a very good vehicle, basically, to allow our customers to deploy, to deploy our products to their accounts. Um, and besides you having said uh, what you're doing with the CDK, I, I like about the fact that at the end, it's that simple product of a CloudFormation template that we can ship to our customers and they can very easily, with a few clicks, deploy that to their accounts. So I think it's, it's really cool that we have a more advanced setup on our side, which allows us to do code sharing and, and use the CDK. But on the other side, what we generate is the the plain CloudFormation template uh, that our um, customers can use very easily without having to deal with the, I don't know, with the CDK or, or any other tools. Just go through the AWS Management Console and deploy the solution. Um, yeah, so um, my topic is uh, also related to infrastructure as code, but um, now um, we are switching tools <laughs> and this is about Terraform. So. Um, as you've probably um, heard of, um, Terraform has changed their license, um, so it is no longer uh, open source, and um, this has uh, this has impacts. So, um, last week I thought about upgrading the Terraform version on my local machine uh, to Terraform uh, 1.6, which is the latest release from, I think, October the 4th or something. And the reason I wanted to do that is because there's a new cool feature in Terraform 1.6, which is Terraform test. So you now can define infrastructure tests in um, basically for your Terraform code uh, very easily. And I like the fact that this is now integrated into Terraform and I don't need any uh, other third party tools uh, to achieve that. Um, but then I was, so when, <laughs> when trying to upgrade basically to Terraform 1.6, I was running into some issues. The first thing is I was doing like I typically do a brew upgrade on my machine. So on macOS, brew, homebrew is a, is a basically a package manager for uh, mostly open source software. Uh, but after doing that, the Terraform version was still um, 1.5 dot something. I think 5.5 .5 is the, the last version with the old license. 
Um, and so it took me a while to find a GitHub um, pull request uh, with Homebrew. Um, and the, reas the reason is that Homebrew is no longer shipping Terraform um, uh, as a bottle. So that is that's basically how they ship uh, all the open source software. So that's basically what, what uh, Homebrew is known for. Uh, instead, they now ship Terraform as the so-called from tap. So that means this is a way how they ship third-party software. Um, so yeah, the thing is now, if you have installed Terraform with Homebrew, um, you have basically to, to upgrade to the latest version, you have to install it from, from HashiCorp's tap instead of uh, just using brew install Terraform, which will ship you only the old version. Um, so this was what I learned, and uh, so I think you should be aware of that if you're using Homebrew and Terraform to install Terraform, um, you should be aware of that. So if you want to get the latest version, you'd have to do brew install HashiCorp slash tab slash Terraform, which then gives you the 1.6 and then later the latest version of Terraform. Um, but then, uh, so I found that out, so I now know how to install <laughs> Terraform 1.6 on my machine. That's fine, yay. Uh, but then the next thing that came to my mind is, oh, is it really a good idea to upgrade my um, Terraform code base and everything to Terraform 1.6? Because the thing is a little bit, if you plan to move to Open Tofu, which is the open source fork of Terraform, then um, the issue is that tof Open Tofu says it will be a drop-in replacement for Terraform compatible with version all versions 1.5.x. So if you do upgrade to version 1.6 now, you might run into ho hopefully only small issues, but maybe in some issues um, when upgrading to Open Tofu later. So that is why I'm at the moment a little bit hesitant to upgrade to ter Terraform 1.6. I want it because I want to use Terraform test uh, as a, as a production-ready feature, but I think it maybe might make sense to stick with Terraform 1.5 for a little while to see how the whole thing with Open Tofu evolves and if you want to switch to that or not um, to find that out. So that is the current uh, situation with, with Terraform. So. I th for me as a developer, a lot of troubles caused by <laughs> HashiCorp switching the license, which annoys me. Um, but yeah, so I think that's the current situation that we are in with Terraform. Yeah, I see. Um, so I definitely wait um, until um, the, the, the thing settled a little bit with the update. Um, so Andreas, I have one more topic um, that we can talk about and this is actually good good news for us as well. So yesterday I, I, I deleted our Jenkins infrastructure <laughs> <laughs> that was running since uh, the beginning of, of our uh, company and our journey. And um, we, we had a lot of stuff shifted to GitHub Actions. Um, I think, I don't know if it was last year or the year before. So we, we had already a lot of things running on GitHub Actions, but there was still some like the older projects and, and stuff that were running on Jenkins. So we, we hadn't spent time on, on, on migrating them to GitHub Actions. So basically what I did <clears throat> last, um, or I think it was last week and, and also the beginning of this week is uh, to take all the uh, remaining jobs in Jenkins and, and convert them or migrate them to GitHub Actions. And um, this is basically, it's I think it's quite straightforward, at least for us. So um, what we had, for example, is uh, our uh, CloudFormation templates, our open source CloudFormation templates. Um, I can share the link. Let me quickly look up the link. And um, they were still running on, on Jenkins. And if I say running, then I mean the acceptance tests as well as the, um, um, the release uh, stuff. So when a new Git tag was added and things like that, it was all done by Jenkins to then copy it to an entry uh, bucket. So this is now in GitHub Actions, and you can see the, the workflow uh, workflows in the um, .github uh, folder there. So it, it, it works quite nice. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm happy. The, the only challenge that I was running into, and this is not really related to, or it's kind of related to GitHub Actions, is that if you use Jenkins, you kind of see 
I'll get a nice uh, visualization of, of, for example, JUnit test results by kind of default. Uh, so it just pops up in, in the Jenkins UI. On, and for GitHub Actions, that's not the case, right? So um, you, you don't see anything besides the logs. And so I'm looking for a way to get uh, a graphical, uh, a nice looking graphical overview of the tests and that failed. And then I can click into details and stuff. So I'm not 100% sure if I solved that. Uh, so I have to check that out actually. Um, we have solved that for for Cradle. So we have Bucket AV is, is, is running on Cradle. Um, the tests uh, at least. And um, for the AWS CF templates project, it still runs on Maven. So this is why it's a little bit different. So I'm still trying to figure that out, how it works um, to get an HTML report. At the moment, I just get XML and um, some, I think, plain text files <laughs> with the test results, which is, I mean, it's okay. You you can figure out um, what went wrong, but it would be uh, like uh, easier if you get just an HTML page and then click on the li uh, on the links and, and, and get all the, the data. Um, so that's not yet um, completely uh, done, um, but um, at least the Jenkins is, is removed. Um, so we don't have the maintenance effort there anymore. So it, it really is some effort. So Jenkins releases new versions regularly. We we so far updated them in our templates because the Jenkins setup itself is, is part of the AWS CF templates. But um, you also have to update all the plugins every time and, and, and things like that. So that's not needed anymore, Andreas. Um, we are done with that. And of course, uh, we run everything on our hyperends for GitHub Actions Runner, right? So uh, we don't use the GitHub Runner, uh, like the official or the included one uh, that is um, maintained by GitHub or run or kind of operated by GitHub to be more precise. We use the one that, that is operated by us. So we still have something on, on our infrastructure where we run all the tests, uh, but um, it is definitely um, now um, easier and the whole Jenkins complexity is, is, is away. Um, uh, I'm very happy with that. Um, so this is kind of a it's kind of cleanup week. So I, I clean up all <laughs> the YAML files, I clean up all our infrastructure and stuff. So uh, it's not really something our customers will notice um, in, in, in the short term, but we hope that in the long term it, it helps us to improve. Uh, both our development speed and of course also the quality that we deliver so yeah i hope it pays off andreas hopefully <laughs> and, and by the way it also reduces our AWS infrastructure costs because we are not yeah that's right jenkins server 24 7. yeah the jenkins yeah. thing and it was also exposed to the internet so it also reduces our our attack surface so it's now basically um gone so we don't use any self-hosted stuff anymore that's public available mm. um, so we definitely have increased that or reduced that as well which is cool um, because, I mean, you never know. And Jenkins had a lot of, I mean, it could basically assume roles in most of our age of this infrastructure. <laughs> so <laughs> it's it's a critical piece of of um, of, of our um, whole uh, security um, exposure. So yeah. yeah, absolutely. Okay, Michael, yeah, thanks for sharing. Um, so I think then that's it. We will be back in two weeks. Subscribe to our newsletter, podcast, or the YouTube channel to make sure you're not missing the upcoming shows. And um, we are also looking forward to your feedback. Hello at cloudonaut.io or find us on LinkedIn and Mastodon. You will find. Yeah, Andreas, I was just sorry. Just sorry, I just saw one comment in <laughs> in LinkedIn. Sorry oh. to interrupt you. So there was um, some some idea from Thomas uh, to to use TFN. So this is kind of a tool to install multiple versions of Terraform at the same time. You can have I think .tfn files or something in the folders and then it will switch to the right version automatically. And that supports 1.6 um, as far um, as I as understand. Mm -hmm. So that could also be a, an, an idea instead of using Homebrew to install Terraform. And I think, I'm not 100% sure, but I think as far as I understand, or as far as I remember, I use it uh, to install Terraform. And I think you can install TFN with probably with Homebrew. So <laughs> <laughs> maybe you can kind of have both uh, Homebrew and, and, and TFN. Yeah, so that could be working as well. And then, yeah, that's a nice little helper. Uh, so sorry for the interruption. Uh, still, um, yeah, all the links will be in the show notes, right? And um, you can uh, l click our uh, research and the, the code examples and, and stuff that I talked about. And besides that, uh, thank you very much for, for joining us this week and, um, um, and have a great day. Perfect. Bye.